scientists are not eliminating God. The eliminating models of God. You learn Sanskrit. Go back to your scriptures. Go back to your Vedas and realize that God is one. Division in Islam is prohibited. We understand the concept of God in Hinduism. Quran is the most positive book. Every day, more than 3,000 fetuses are being aborted in India after the identified that the females. According to the statutes of 1996, U.S. Department of Justice, 2,730 women are being raped every day. Every 32 seconds, one woman is being raped. I've been raped in U.S. until the time I'm here. Islam has the solutions to the problems of the West. Of the West. Universal brotherhood. Islam, which helps in universal brotherhood prevailing throughout the world. And if anyone saves a human being, they have saved the whole of humankind. Where love and companionship is concerned, the women have a degree of advantage. Let's say I seek refuge with the Lord of humankind. Oh, humankind, eat of what is on the earth, good and lawful for you. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen Wa salatu wa salamu ala nabihil kareem Wa ala yashabi yajmeen Wa salamu ala man ittabi'il huda Amma baad Good morning ladies and gentlemen It is indeed a matter of great pleasure and pride for all the citizens of Hivandi to have among us today Dr. Zakir Naik. I take this opportunity to welcome Dr. Zakir Naik and the dignitaries from all walks of the life on behalf of the organizers, AXA Educational Society. It's very kind of Mr. Hingurani, a senior advocate, to have accepted to preside today's function. Mr. K. R. Hingurani, advocate for last 45 years in Bhivandi. He was president of Bhivandi Bar Association for last six years. And he has in-depth studied comparative religion. Our chief guest of the day, Prabhakar Hegde's personality is well known to Bhivandi people. He is a leading lawyer of state for last 50 years. He was also a member of the Law Commission, and he is pioneer of the Legal Aid and Lok Dalat, which was first held in Bhivandi. At the age of 75 years, he is still an active advocate and ideal for aspiring young advocates. He has written books for the guidance of the junior practicing lawyers on subjects like bail and injunctions. As veteran congressman, he was district congress president and also Vice President of MPCC. Presently, he is busy defending Tada victims in Bombay. Our main speaker, Dr. Zakir Naik, President of Islamic Research Foundation, is a dynamic international orator on Islam and comparative religion. He is the main driving spirit by Alhamdulillah behind the Islamic Research Foundation getting worldwide acclaim for the proper presentation, understanding and clarification of Islam as well as removing misconception about Islam. Though a medical doctor by professional training, he has turned around to spread the real truth of Islam worldwide, especially amongst millions of English-speaking audience. At only 32 years, Dr. Zakir explains the teachings of Islam and clears misconceptions convincingly with the help of reason, logic, and science. He has tremendous ability to quote extensively and verbatim from Holy Quran and other religious scriptures. Dr. Zakir is renowned for his critical analysis and his spontaneous and convincing answers to challenging questions posed by the audiences and skeptics about his public talks in open question and answer sessions. He has delivered more than 200 public talks in the last two years itself in the United States of America, Canada, United Kingdom, Saudi Arabia, Bahrain, UAE, Kuwait, Qatar, Sri Lanka, Malaysia, and Singapore. In addition to many public talks in India, he has also participated in symposium with prominent personalities of all the other faiths. Dr. Zakir has appeared on various international TV programs 
and satellite and TV channels programs in the United States of America, Malaysia, India, etc. He is regularly quizzed and interviewed by the media worldwide, especially on why Islam conflicts with issues of women's rights, human rights, modern science and secularism. But his dynamic resolve to dispel media myths about Islam with facts, specific references and proper context stand out to rectify or neutralize the prejudice or media bias, if any, based on unwarranted presumption or conclusion. More than a hundred of Dr. Zaki's lectures, debates, and symposia available on video and audio cassettes are popular. He has authored books on Islam and comparative religion. Alhamdulillah. Wa salatu wa salam. Wa rasulillah. Wa ala ali wa sabi ajmain. Amma baad. Auz billahi min ash-shaytani rajim. Bismillahir rahmanir rahim. يا أيها الناس اتقوا ربكم الذي خلقكم من نفس واحدة خلق منها زوجها بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم يا أيها الناس إن خلقناكم من زق وأنثى وجعلناكم شعوبا وقبائل لا تعرفوا إن كرمكم من الله يتقاكم إن الله عليم خبير بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم رب شهلي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل الأقدة من لساني يفكه كولي Respected Advocate Hegde, Respected Advocate Hingorani, my respected elders, and my dear brothers and sisters, I welcome all of you with Islamic greetings. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. May peace, blessings, and mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, of Almighty God, be on all of you. The topic of this morning's talk is universal brotherhood. There are various types of brotherhoods. For example, brotherhood based on blood relationships, brotherhood based on regions, on race, on caste, on creeds, etc. But all these types of brotherhood, they are limited. Islam, alhamdulillah, believes in universal brotherhood. It doesn't believe that human beings have been created in castes or in different levels. And I start my talk by quoting a verse from the glorious Quran, from Surah Hujurat, chapter number 49, verse number 13, which describes the Islamic concept of universal brotherhood in the best way. It says, Ya ayyuha nasu, inna khalaqnaakum min zakrin wa unsa, wa ja'alnaakum shu'uba wa qaba'ila li ta'arafu, inna kramakum, inda Allah yadkakum, inna Allah alimun khabir, which means that, O humankind, we have created you from a single pair of male and female, and have divided you into nations and tribes, so that you shall recognize each other, not that you shall despise each other. And the most honored in the sight of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the person who has taqwa. And Allah is all-knowing, full of knowledge, and well acquainted with all things. This verse of the glorious Quran says that, O humankind, we have created you from a single pair of male and female. That means the whole human race originates from a single pair of male and female. All the human beings in the world, they have a common grandparent. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that we have divided the human race into nations and tribes so that they shall recognize each other. Not that they shall despise and fight amongst themselves. And the criteria for judgment in the sight of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, this verse says, doesn't depend on sex, caste, color, creed, or wealth, but it depends on taqwa, that is God consciousness, that's piety, that's righteousness. Anyone who's more righteous, who's more pious, who's more God-conscious, is honored in the sight of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. 
and Allah has full knowledge and is well acquainted with all things. Further, the glorious Quran says in Surah Room, chapter number 30, verse number 22, that, and amongst his signs is the creation of the heavens and the earth, and the variation in your languages and your colors. Verily, in that is a sign for those who know. The glorious Quran says that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created various types of languages and different colors, black, human being, white, brown, yellow. And these are signs. These variations in color of the language is not to despise each other because every language that you have on the face of the earth, it's a beautiful language. It may sound funny if it is unique to you. You may not have heard that language before. It may sound funny. But those people who speak that language, for them, it's the most beautiful language. So Allah says, he has created various languages and colors so that you may recognize, you may know each other. And the glorious Quran says, in Surah Isra, chapter number 17, Verse number 70, وَلَقَدْ قَرَّمْنَا بَنِي آدَمَ That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Almighty God, has honored the children of Adam. Allah doesn't say that he has honored only the Arabs or the Americans or a particular race, but Almighty God has honored all the children of Adam, irrespective of race, caste, color, creed, or sex. And there are many faiths there are many religions who believe that the humankind has originated from a single pair. That is Adam and Eve, peace be upon them. But there are some faiths which say that it is because of the sin of the woman, that is Eve, may Allah be pleased with her, that the human beings are born in sin. And they put the blame only on the woman, that is Eve, for the downfall of the human beings. In fact, the Quran speaks about the story of Adam and Eve, peace be upon them, in several places. But in all the places, the blame is equally put on both of them, Adam and Eve, peace be upon them. And if you read Surah Araf, chapter number 7, verse number 19 to 27, Adam and Eve, peace be upon them, they are addressed more than a dozen of times. And the Quran says, that both of them disobeyed Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Almighty God. Both of them repented and both were forgiven. Both are equally blamed for the mistake. There is not a single verse in the glorious Quran which puts the blame only on Eve. May Allah be pleased with her. But there is a verse in the glorious Quran in Surah Taha, chapter number 20, verse number 121, which says, that Adam, peace be upon him, disobeyed Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But if you read the Quran, both are equally blamed for not obeying Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They both repented and they both were forgiven. If you read the Quran, both are equally blamed for not obeying Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They both repented and they both were forgiven. And certain faiths, they say that because Eve disobeyed Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and responsible for the sin of humankind, which Islam doesn't agree, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala cursed the woman and said that she will bear labor pains. That means pregnancy is a curse according to some people, which Islam doesn't agree at all. And the Qari recited the verse from the glorious Quran from Surah Nisa, chapter number four, verse number one, which says, respect the womb that bore you. In Islam, pregnancy does not degrade a woman, it uplifts a woman. And the Quran says in Surah Luqman, chapter 31, verse number 14, that, O oh, humankind, we have enjoined on you to be good to your parents. In travail upon travail, did your mother bore him, and in years to wane was his weaning. The Quran says in Surah Ahqaf, chapter 46, 
verse number 15, we have enjoined on the human beings to be kind to the parents. In pain did his mother bore him, and in pain did she give him birth. Pregnancy uplifts a woman, it does not degrade her. And in Islam, men and women are equal. And according to a hadith, which is mentioned in Sahih Bukhari, worm number eight, in the book of Adab, chapter number two, hadith number two, a person came to the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Muhammad peace be upon him, and asked him that who is the person who deserves the maximum love and companionship in this world? And the Prophet said, your mother. The man asked, who next? The Prophet said, your mother. The man asked, after that who? The Prophet repeated for the third time, your mother. The man asked, after that who? Then the Prophet said, your father. In short, 75%, three-fourths of the love and companionship of the children are due to the mother. 25%, one-fourth of the love and companionship goes to the father. In short, the mother gets the gold medal. She gets the silver medal, as well as the bronze medal. The father has to be satisfied with the mere consolation prize. These are the teachings of Islam. In Islam, men and women are equal. But equality does not mean identicality. There are many misconceptions, especially when women are concerned in Islam. Many Muslims and non-Muslims, they have a misconception, which can be removed if you understand the authentic sources, Quran and the Sahih Hadith correctly. As I mentioned, men and women are overall equal. But equality does not mean identicality. Let me give you an example. That if in a class of students, two students, student A and B, they come out first, and both acquire 80 marks out of 100. But if you analyze the answer sheet, there are 10 questions, each carrying 10 marks. In the first answer, student A gets 9 out of 10. Student B gets 7 out of 10. So in question 1, student A has a degree of advantage than student B. In question 2, student B gets 9 out of 10. And student A gets 7 out of 10. In question 2, student B has a degree of advantage than student A. In the remaining 8 questions, both get 8 out of 10. And if you total the marks of both the students, both get 80 out of 100. So if you analyze, both student A and B are overall equal. But in the answers to some questions, student A has a degree of advantage. In answers to some questions, student B has a degree of advantage. But overall, both are equal. Similarly in Islam, men and women are equal. Brotherhood in Islam does not only mean that the same sexes are equal. The universal brother in Islam means that besides race, caste, and creed, even the sex are overall equal. Men and women are equal in Islam. But in some aspects, the men have a degree of advantage. In some aspects, the women have a degree of advantage. But overall, both are equal. For example, if a robber enters my house, I will not say that I believe in women's rights, I believe in women's liberation, therefore my sister, my wife, my mother should go and fight the robber. Because Allah says in Surah Nisa chapter 4 verse 34 that Allah has given men more strength than the other. That men have more strength than the women. So where strength is concerned, the men have a degree of advantage. So since they have been given more strength, it's their duty to protect the women. Here, the men have a degree of advantage. Where love and companionship is concerned, where children should give to the parents, the women have a degree of advantage. As I mentioned earlier, the mother gets three times more respect and companionship than the father. Here, the women have a degree of advantage. But overall, if you analyze, men and women are equal in Islam. And for more details, you can refer to my video cassette. I had given a talk on women's rights in Islam, modernizing outdated. It's part one. 
that is the lecture, and part two is the question and the session. These discuss the issue in great detail, and many misconceptions which are there in the minds of the human being have been removed here. And in this talk, I've divided the women's rights in Islam under six broad headings, spiritual rights, economic rights, social rights, legal rights, educational rights, and the political rights. And I've described there that overall men and women are equal. The concept of Almighty God in Islam, of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, is not that Almighty God, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, is the deity of a particular race or a particular group of people. But the Quran says in Surah Fatiha, chapter number one, verse number two, Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen, praise be to the Lord of the worlds. Almighty God is referred as Rabbil Alameen, the Lord of the worlds. And in the last surah of the glorious Quran, that is Surah Nas, chapter 114, verse number one, it says, Pul auz bi Rabbil Nas, that say, I seek refuge with the Lord of humankind. Almighty God, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, is the Lord of the whole of humankind, not of a particular group of people or a particular race. And there are various verses in the glorious Quran which begin by saying, Ya ayyuhan nas, O humankind. Ya ayyuhan nas, O humankind. Ya ayyuhan nas, O humankind. And even the two verses I quote in the beginning of my talk, they began with, Ya ayyuhan nas, O humankind. And the glorious Quran also says, in Surah Baqarah, chapter number two, verse number 168, Ya ayyuhan nas, O humankind, Eat of what is on the earth, good and lawful for you. And follow not the footstep of the devil, for he is to you an avowed enemy. Islam, in order for universal brotherhood to prevail in the world, it has a moral code. It has a moral law, which helps in universal brotherhood prevailing throughout the world, throughout the universe. The Quran says in Surah Maida, chapter number 5, verse number 32, that if anyone kills a person, unless it be for murder or for spreading mischief in the land, it is as though he has killed the whole nation, all the people. And if any person saves a life, it is as though he has saved the whole of humankind, all the people. The Quran says that if any person kills any human being, whether it be a Muslim or non-Muslim, it doesn't specify the race or caste or color or creed. If any person kills any human being, unless it be for murder or for spreading mischief in the land, it is as though he has killed the whole of humanity. And if anyone saves any human being, whether it be a Muslim or non-Muslim, from any caste, color, or creed, it is as though he has saved the whole of humankind. The Quran has various laws of moral conduct so that universal brotherhood will prevail throughout the universe. The glorious Quran says that no one should ever rob. It's a crime. It's a sin. Islam has a system of zakat that is, any rich person who has a saving of more than the nisab level, 85 grams of gold, he or she should give 2.5% of that saving every lunar year in charity. If every human being in the world gives zakat, poverty will be eradicated from this world. There will not be a single human being who will die of hunger. If every human being in the world gives zakat, poverty will be eradicated from this world. There will not be a single human being who will die of hunger. And the glorious Quran says that you should love and help your neighbors. The Quran says in Surah Ma'un, chapter 107, verse number 1 to 7. 
only to be seen of men who do not even provide neighborly assistance the quran says that woe to those people who do not even provide neighborly assistance and a beloved prophet muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam said that he is not a muslim who sleeps with his full stomach while his neighbors are hungry that means any person who sleeps with his full stomach that means had a good meal while his neighbors are hungry is not following the commandments of allah and his rasul the glorious quran says that do not be a spendthrift the quran says in surah isra chapter number 17 verse number 26 and 27 that do not squander your wealth like that of a spendthrift for verily spendthrifts are the brothers of the evil one of the satan If you are a spendthrift, you are bound to disturb the universal brotherhood. Because, but natural, if a person squanders, it creates animosity, it creates enmity, it creates envy between the brothers. A person should not rob. A person should give charity. A person should provide neighborly assistance. All these are moral conducts mentioned in the glorious Quran. The Quran further says. that you should not bribe the quran says in surah baqarah chapter number 2 verse number 188 that spend not your wealth on vanities and do not use it as a bait for judges in order you may eat somebody else's property that means do not use your wealth to bribe the people so that you may eat up other people's wealth islam doesn't agree in eating up your brother's wealth and the glorious quran says in surah maida chapter number 5 verse number 90 ya ayyuhal ladina amanu o you believe innama al khamru wal maisuru most certainly intoxicants and gambling wal ansab wal azlam dedication of stones divination of arrows rishu min amali shaitan these are satan's handiwork fast and ibulla lakum tuflihun abstain from this handiwork that you may prosper the glorious quran says that abstain from having intoxicants alcohol drugs from gambling from dedication of stones divination of arrows all these are satan's handiwork and we know that intoxicants is one of the root cause for various evils in the society it prevents the universal brotherhood from prevailing and according to statistics it tells us that in america on average every day more than 1900 cases of rape take place and in most of the cases either the victim or the rapist is intoxicated the studies of america tell us that there is 8% of incest in america that means every 12th or 13th person you come across in america he has committed incest that is having sexual relationship with close relatives father and daughter son and mother brother and sister and majority almost all the cases it's under the state of intoxication aids is spreading in the world one of the reason is intoxicants therefore the quran says intoxicants and gambling it's a satan's handiwork abstain from this handiwork that you may prosper if you abstain from these evil things universal brotherhood will be helped in prevailing throughout the universe the glorious quran says in surah isra chapter number 17 verse number 32 nor come close to adultery for it is a shameful deed it's an evil opening other roads to evil islam is against adultery The glorious Quran says in Surah Hujurat, 
chapter 49, verse number 11 and 12, that, Ya ayyuhal lazina amun, O you believe, let not some men among you laugh at the others. You may never know that the latter may be better than the former. Let not some women among you laugh at the other. You may never know that the latter may be better than the former. Do not defame one another, nor be sarcastic, or call each other with nicknames. Avoid suspicion. For in many cases, suspicion is a sin. Do not spy on one another. Do not backbite. Do not speak ill of one another behind the backs. Are you ready to eat the dead meat of your brother? The Quran says that if you backbite, if you slander anyone behind the back, it is as though you are eating the meat of your dead brother. And eating the meat of your dead brother is a double sin. Eating dead meat itself is prohibited. Eating meat of your dead brother is double crime. Even the cannibals who eat human beings, they do not eat the flesh of their brother. So if you backbite, if you speak ill about somebody else behind the back, it is a double crime. It is eating the meat of your dead brother. And the Quran gives the answer. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, nay, you would abhor it. No one would ever like it. The Quran says in Surah Humza, chapter 104, verse number one, Wa lumaza. Go to every kind of scandal monger and backbiter. All these laws of moral conduct, given the glorious Quran and Sayyid Hadith, they promote universal brotherhood. Besides talking about universal brotherhood, the uniqueness about Islam is that it practically demonstrates the universal brotherhood. The Muslims are supposed to demonstrate the universal brotherhood five times a day in the Salah. When we offer Salah, we practically demonstrate the universal brotherhood. It's mentioned in Sahih Bukhari, volume number one, in the book of Adan, chapter number 75, hadith number 692, that Hazrat Anas, Allah be pleased with him, he said, that when we stood for Salah, the shoulder of the companions touched with the shoulder of the companion. Our feet touched with the feet of a companion. The beloved prophet said, it's mentioned Sunnah Abu Dawood, volume number one, in the book of Salah, chapter number 245, Hadith number 666, our beloved prophet said, before starting the Salah, that straighten your rows, stand shoulder to shoulder, and do not leave any gap or opening for the devil. The prophet said, stand close to each other during Salah, and do not leave any opening for the devil. The prophet was not referring to the devil, which you see in the Onida TV ad. You know the Onida TV ad? The devil with the two horns and a tail? The Prophet was not referring to that devil. He was referring to the devil of racism, of caste, of color, of wealth, irrespective whether you're rich or poor, whether you're king or pauper. When you stand for prayers, when you stand for salah, stand shoulder to shoulder. So that the brotherhood increases. The devil of racism, of caste, of color, of creed, of wealth does not come in between you. And the best example of international brotherhood is in the pilgrimage of Islam, that is during Hajj. About two and a half million people from various parts of the world, they come to Mecca to perform Hajj. People from various parts of the world, from America, from Canada, from UK, from Singapore, from Malaysia, from India, from Pakistan, from Indonesia, from various parts of the world they come, and the men, they are dressed up in two pieces of unsewn cloth, that preferably white. You cannot identify that the person standing next to you, whether he's a king or a pauper. It is the best example of international brotherhood. It is the biggest annual gathering of the world. Two and a half million people gather every year. And the person standing next to you, you cannot make out whether he's a king or a pauper. Irrespective whether you're rich or poor, black or white, from whichever part of the world you're coming, you're dressed in the same attire. And our beloved Prophet Muhammad said, 
in the speech of his favorite pilgrimage. He said that there is only one God and no Arab is superior to a non-Arab, nor is a non-Arab superior to an Arab. A white is not superior to a black, nor a black over the white. The only criteria for superiority is taqwa, its righteousness, its piety, its God consciousness. Irrespective of whichever race you belong to, whichever color you have, that doesn't make you superior. In the sight of Allah, all are equal. Only if you're more pious, more God conscious, more righteous, can you be superior to the other human being. And when the Hajj is performed, every person, he recites, Labbaik Allahumma Labbaik, Labbaik La Sharika Laka Labbaik, Inna Alhamda, Wal Ni'amata, Laka Wal Mulk, La Sharika Laka. They keep on repeating, Labbaik Allahumma Labbaik, Labbaik La Sharika Laka Labbaik. Even when he comes back from Hajj, that always remains in his mind, Labbaik Allahumma Labbaik, which means, here I am. Oh my Lord, here I am. Labbaik La Sharika Laka Labbaik, here I am. You have no partners, here I am. Inna alhamda wal ni'amata. All praises are due to you. All bounties are yours. Laka wal mulk, la sharika lak. To you belong the whole dominion, the whole universe, and you have no partners. It is ingrained in his mind that labbaik Allahumma labbaik. Here I am, oh my Lord, here I am. The cornerstone of the Islamic faith is the belief in one and only soul, creator and sustainer of the entire universe. He alone deserves worship. And it is because of belief in one God that there can be universal brotherhood. That means the same God has created all the human beings, irrespective whether they are rich or poor, whether a male or female, whether black or white, whichever caste, color, creed you belong to, all of them are equal because you are created by one and only sole creator, Almighty God. Only if you believe in one God can you practice universal brotherhood. That's the reason that all the major religions which believe in the concept of God, on a higher level, they believe in the existence of one almighty God. And according to Oxford Dictionary, religion means a belief in a superhuman controlling power, a God or gods that deserve worship and obedience. So in short, if you want to analyze any religion, you have to understand the concept of God in that religion. And the best way to analyze the concept of God in any religion is not by looking at what the followers are doing because many of the followers themselves do not know what the religious scriptures speak about Almighty God. The best way is to analyze what the scripture of that religion has to speak about Almighty God. And the glorious Quran says in Surah Al-Imran, chapter number 3, verse number 64, Kul, ya al kitab, say, O people of the book, ta'ala wila kalmitin sawa'im banyana baynakum that come to come in terms as between us and you. Which is the first term? Allah na'buda illallah. That we worship none but Allah. Wala nushrika bihi shayyaw. That we associate no partners with him. Wala yattaghida baaduna baadban arbaban minun illah. That we erect not among ourselves lords and patrons other than Allah. Fain tawallaw. If then they turn back. Fakulu shadu. Say ye bear witness. Bianna Muslimun, that we are Muslims, bowing our will to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah shows you a way how to speak with different people. It says, Ta'ala wila kalmitin sawa'im, bainana bainakum, that come to common terms as between us and you. Which is the first term? Allah na'buda illallah, that we worship none but Allah. Wala nushrika bihi shayyam, that we associate no partners with him. So in order to understand the concept of God in any religion, you have to understand what that scripture has to speak about Almighty God. If you understand the concept of God, 
you will understand the religion. Let's first analyze the concept of God in Hinduism. If you ask a common Hindu, who's a layman, that how many gods are there? Some may say three, some may say hundred, some may say thousand, while others may say 33 crores, 330 million. But if you ask a learned person, who's well versed with the Hindu scriptures, he will tell you that the Hindus should actually worship only one God. And they should believe only in one God. But the common Hindu, he believes in a philosophy known as pantheism. What the common Hindu says, that everything is God. The tree is God, the sun is God, the moon is God, the monkey is God, the human being is God, the snake is God. What we Muslims say, that everything is God's. G-O-D with apostrophe, yes. Everything belongs to God. The tree belongs to God, the sun belongs to God, the moon belongs to God, the monkey belongs to God, the human being belongs to God, the snake belongs to God. So the major difference between the Hindus and the Muslims is that the common Hindu says everything is God. We Muslims say everything is God's. G-O-D with apostrophe, yes. The only difference is apostrophe, yes. If we can solve this difference of apostrophe, yes, the Hindus and the Muslims will be united. How do we do it? Quran says, Ta'ala wila kalmitin sawa'im, bainana bainakum. That come to common terms as between us and you. Which is the first term? Allah, na'buda illallah. That we worship none but Allah. The most common scripture, which is the most widely read by the Hindus, is the Bhagavad Gita. If you read Bhagavad Gita, Chapter number 7, verse number 20, it says that all those whose intelligence has been stolen by material desires, they worship demigods. That means those whose intelligence has been stolen by material desires, they worship God besides the one true God. And if you read the Upanishads, which is another sacred scripture of the Hindus, it's mentioned in the Chandogya Upanishad. Chapter number 6, section number 2, verse number 1. Ekam evidityam. There is only one God without a second. It's mentioned in the Sveta Svetara Upanishad. Chapter number 6, verse number 9. Na kasya kasij janita na kadipa. Which means, of him, of Almighty God, there are no lords, neither does he have any parents. It's mentioned in the Sveta Svetara Upanishad. Chapter number 4, verse number 19. Na tasya pratima asti. Of him, there is no likeness. It's mentioned in the Sveta Svetara Upanishad, chapter number 4, verse number 20, that he has got no form. No one can see him with the eyes. Among the scriptures of the Hindus, the most sacred are the Vedas. There are basically four Vedas. The Rig Ved, the Ajur Ved, the Sam Ved, and the Atharva Ved. If you read the Ajur Ved, it's mentioned in chapter number 32, verse number 3. Nata Sipratima Asti. Of him, there is no image. Almighty God has got no images. It's mentioned in the Ayurved, chapter number 40, verse number 8, that Almighty God is bodiless and pure. And the next verse of Yajurved, chapter number 40, verse number 9, says that Andhatma Pavishanti Ya Asambhuti Mupaste. That they are entering darkness, those who worship the Asambhuti. Asambhuti means the natural things, like air, water, fire. And the verse continues, they are entering more in darkness, those who worship the Sambhuti. Sambhuti are the created things, like chair, table, idols, etc. Who says that? Yajurved, chapter number 40, verse number 9. Further, if you read, it's mentioned in the Atharva Ved, chapter number 3, hymn number 58, verse number 3, Dev Maha Osi, verily great is Almighty God. Amongst the Vedas, the most sacred is the Rig Ved. It's mentioned in Rig Ved, book number one, hymn number 164, verse number 46, that sages and saintly people call Almighty God by various names. And if you read Rig Ved, book number two, hymn number one, there are various attributes given to Almighty God. One amongst them, it's mentioned in Rig Ved, 
बुक नंबर टू हिम नंबर वन वर्स नंबर थ्री ब्राह्मा इफ यू ट्रांसलेट ब्राह्मा इन टू इंग्लिश वन ऑफ इट्स मीनिंग इज द क्रिएटर इफ यू ट्रांसलेट इन टू अरबिक इट मीन्स खालिक वी मुस्लिम्स हैव गॉट नो ऑब्जेक्शन इफ सम कॉज ऑल माई टी गॉड एज खालिक or creator or brahma but if someone says that brahma is almighty god who has got four heads and on each head is a crown we muslims take strong objection to it moreover you are going against swata swata upanishad chapter number 6 verse number 9 which says na tasipati ma asti of him there is no likeness you are giving an image to almighty god and the beautiful attribute given in rig ved book number 2 hymn number 1 verse number 3 is vishnu if you translate vishnu into english one of its meaning is the sustainer the cherisher if you translate into arabic it means rob we muslims have got no objection if someone calls almighty god as rob or sustainer or cherisher or vishnu but if someone says that vishnu is almighty god who has got four hands and one of his hands is the chakra the discus and one of his hands is the lotus we muslims take strong objection to it moreover you are giving an image to almighty god you are going against yajurved chapter number 32 verse number 3 which says na tasipati ma asti of him there is no image it's mentioned in rigved volume number 8 chapter number 1 verse number 1 march the nidhi sansad all praises are due to him alone worship him alone it's mentioned in rigved volume number 6 hymn number 45 verse number 16 ya ek it mushtihi there is only one god worship him alone and the brahma sutra the fundamental creed of hinduism is ek kam brahm dusya naste niya naste kinchan भगवान एक ही है दूसरा नहीं है नहीं है नहीं है जरा भी नहीं है देर इज ओनली वन गॉड नॉट अ सेकेंड वन नॉट एट ऑल नॉट एट ऑल नॉट इन द लीस्ट बिट सो इफ यू रीड द हिंदू स्क्रिप्चर्स यू शुड अंडरस्टैंड द कॉन्सेप्ट ऑफ गॉड इन हिंदुजम लेट्स एनालाइज द कॉन्सेप्ट ऑफ गॉड इन जुडाइजम इट्स मैंशन इन द बुक ऑफ डिट्रॉनमी इन द ओल्ड टेस्टमिन चैप्ट नंबर सिक्स वर्स नंबर फोर Moses peace be upon him says that shama israilo adna ila haino adna ikhad it's a hebrew quotation which means yoro israel the lord our god is one lord it's mentioned in the book of isaiah chapter number 43 verse number 11 i even i am lord and beside me there is no savior it's mentioned in the book of isaiah chapter number 45 verse number 5 i am lord and there is none else there is no god besides me it's mentioned in the book of isaiah chapter number 46 verse number 9 i am god and there is none else i am god and there is none like me it's mentioned in the book of exodus chapter number 20 verse number 3 and 5 as well as the book of deuteronomy chapter number 5 verse number 7 to 9 it says that thou shall have none other god besides me almighty god is speaking here that thou shall have none other god besides me thou shall not make unto thee any graven image of any likeness of anything in the heavens above in the earth beneath and in the water beneath the earth thou shall not serve them nor bow down to them for i thy god is a jealous god so if you read the old testament we shall understand the concept of god in judaism araita allazi yukazzibu biddin fazalika allazi yadu al yatim wa la yahuddu ala ta'mil miskin fa wailul lil musallin allazina hum an salatihim sahun allazina hum yuraun wa yanawun al maun that says thou not the person who deny 